Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video. And today I'm going to be discussing my thoughts on Charles Dickens' Nicholas Nickleby. So back in January, I reread Nicholas Nickleby by Charles Dickens, um, and today I'm going to be making a video all about my thoughts on it, my reflections on rereading Nicholas Nickleby. I reread this as part of the Mega Dickens Read Along, which is a read along that I'm hosting, um, which I am hosting for two years, <laughs> and we're reading all of Charles Dickens' novels in publication order, from his first book, The Pickwick Papers, right up until his last unfinished novel. And Nicholas Nickleby is the third novel that Dickens published, and we were reading it in January and February. It was my third or fourth reading I think probably my fourth um, and it was really interesting to reread I have lots of thoughts that I thought I would share with you today so this video is going to be partly spoiler free it will be spoiler free for I would say two thirds of the video and then I will tell you when I'm going into spoilery territory and let you leave and run away if you haven't read Nicholas Nickleby yet um, but for now we're going to be sticking in spoiler free territory so let me tell you a little bit about what Nicholas Nickleby is about. It is the story of a young man called Nicholas Nickleby. Um, he is 19 years old when his father dies and he and his younger sister Kate and their mother, Mrs Nickleby, they're left to fend for themselves. They go to London to track down their uncle, Ralph Nickleby, hoping he'll be able to help them because they have heard that he is rich. But Ralph Nickleby is a miser who doesn't want to help them. Um, so he kind of... Um, tries to dispose of them in the best way he can. Um, he gets Kate a job as a seamstress and sends Nicholas to um, work as a school teacher at a horrible boarding school. And everything kind of goes on from there. It's quite a sort of like episodic novel um, looking at Nicholas and Kate's lives. It's kind of a coming of age story in many ways, I suppose. I didn't read this physically. I listened to it on audiobook. I listened to the um, audiobook on Audible, which is part of the Audible Dickens collection narrated by Covner Holbrook Smith, which is really, really good. It was a great audiobook. He has a fantastic voice um, and I really, really enjoyed listening to it on audiobook. Dickens just works so well on audiobook for me. In terms of my general thoughts on Nicholas Nickleby, I have to say that, like, I like it. It's fun. There are things in it that I really enjoy. There are characters in it that I love. But it's just, it's just not as interesting as so many other Dickens books. Like, there are things in it that are really great. But I think it is still firmly, like, very near the bottom of my Charles Dickens ranking. I think, really, On a Twist is my least favourite Dickens. Nicholas Nickleby is my second least favourite. Like, there are things in it I like, but there are also things that I don't like. And I just feel like there are many, many more exciting Dickens books to come. I do feel like one issue with doing a mega Dickens read along in publication order from his first book to his last book is that many of my favourite Dickens books are later on so I feel like I'm just being a bit of a downer for all the kind of opening books of the read-along. I feel like it's just like, you know, gonna be like six to nine months of me being like, well, this isn't the best Dickens before we get on to the great stuff. But anyway, there are things about Nicholas Nickleby that I do really like. Um, I feel like I struggle with the two main characters, Nicholas and Kate, because I find them a bit bland, which I think is sort of the point. Like, I think Nicholas is meant to be a bit of a every man hero. I kind of get that, but also I find him a little bit dull. <laughs> I do find some of the minor characters in Nicholas Nickleby really interesting. Newman Nog steals the show for me, absolutely. He is probably the reason why I would say that I do love Nicholas Nickleby as a book. I think it's just Newman Noggs, because I feel like if Newman Noggs wasn't in this book, I'd be like, yeah, this is not that great. Whereas I still think it's not great in terms of Dickens, but I do still love it because Newman Oggs is there. I'm also really fond of the character of Smike. I think the Kenwigs are great. I really, really like John Brody, who I've completely forgotten about since the last time I read it, but he's a wonderful character. I think Ralph Nickleby, um, Nicholas's uncle, who is sort of, you know, the villain of the piece, I think he's really well drawn too. But I just find Kate and Nicholas quite bland. There's a character later on in the book called Madeline, who I also find very bland. Um, and I feel like Mrs. Nickleby, Kate and Nicholas's mother, I just feel like her presentation is so mean. Like, I just feel like Dickens, throughout Nicholas Nickleby, is just laughing at her because she's a slightly older woman who isn't that clever. And Dickens just seems to find that hilarious. And it just feels really, really mean. Um, and, like, Dickens can be mean. And I think maybe it's important to remember that. Like, actually, I think there is quite a lot of stuff in his books that is quite mean. Like, he relies a lot on stereotypes and caricatures in his characterization, which sometimes is hilarious and sometimes is fantastic, but also sometimes is very mean. I feel like he is less mean in his later books, but maybe I will be proved wrong as I read them all in order, I don't know. But I do feel like his characterization is more compassionate in his later books. For example, there's a character in Nicholas Nickleby. Um, he appears later on, but he's not very important, so I don't think it's very spoilery to say. Um, but at one point, 
Mrs. Nickleby ends up living next door to a man who is considered mad. And Dickens basically just tries to encourage the reader to laugh at this man. And I feel like if I compare that characterization to the characterization of someone like Mr. Dick, who we will meet when we get to David Copperfield, Mr. Dick is also a character who people around him perceive to be mad. And I just feel like the presentation of Mr. Dick is really humanized and compassionate. And I just feel like the characterization of the man in Nicholas Nickleby is so entirely not. Which actually leads me quite nicely onto talking about kind of chronology and where Nicholas Nickleby sits in terms of Dickens's um, work over time. I do definitely feel that Nicholas Nickleby feels like more what I expect from a Dickens book in terms of its props. Um, like it is still definitely episodic in a way that his earlier books do tend to be. Um, and you can see kind of hangovers from sort of Pickwick Papers in that, um, in how Nicholas Nickleby kind of travels around different places and meets different people. And we kind of have like blocks, sections of the book where he's with one group of people and then he moves on to another group of people. And we even kind of have like a few short stories inserted into the text where characters are telling other characters stories, which is something Dickens used a lot in the Pickwood Papers, um, but he doesn't really use, I don't think, after Nicholas Nickleby. Do you think that the plot feels tighter in Nicholas Nickleby than in Oliver Twist or the Pickwood Papers? Um, like I feel like it has that very Dickensian kind of interweaving plots moving between lots of different characters and Yes, we do have this kind of episodic nature, but a lot of characters that we meet kind of earlier on do kind of end up becoming important in the climax of the book and we end up meeting again later, which is a very kind of Dickensian thing that you'll see in a lot of his books. I also feel like I like Nicholas Nickleby's like tone and his balance of light and shade um, a lot. So like, I feel like, I love the Pickle Papers so much, but I feel like the Pickle Papers is all humor. Um, I mean, it's not entirely, but it kind of is. And then I feel like, Oliver Twist is all grim um, and then I feel like Nicholas Nickleby and a lot of Dickens' other books are much more kind of in between and a balance of the two and I do really like in Nicholas Nickleby that I do think it has that balance of light and shade of humour and more serious stuff um, which I really like. I will say though one thing that I do feel like Nicholas Nickleby doesn't have which Dickens gets much better at later on in his novels is that I do feel like the love stories in Nicholas Nickleby are terrible um, just really underdeveloped and bad. And I feel like later on in his career, Charles Dickens became great at love stories, but not, not when he was writing Nicholas Nickleby, no. Like I said, I do think the plot is probably stronger than Oliver Twist or The Paper Papers. Um, it works as a coming of age story, and I like how we see Nicholas kind of move through different stages of his life, um, through different jobs, through different kind of bits of the world, I suppose. We see him in the world of teaching, in the world of theatre, in the world of business, um, and that is kind of really interesting to see, I think. And I kind of like how we move back and forth between him and Kate um, and kind of see the different aspects of their lives. I feel like there are some bits of the plot of Nicholas Nickleby that I really like. Um, I feel like the villain plot, I suppose, let's say, um, is really good and I really like it. Um, but I do feel like the love stories, as I said, are not good. Um, and there are some bits of the ending that really annoy me, but more on that later when I get into spoilers. I wanted to talk a little bit more about characterization because I do feel like characterization is such an important thing in Dickens for me. And I do feel like the reason why Nicholas Nickleby is so like far down on my list of Charles Dickens' love is just because I find Nicholas and Kate such bland characters. Um, and I just, I just find it really hard to be invested in them in the same way that I am invested in other characters in later Dickens books. Saying that, I did find that I slightly liked Kate Nickleby more on this reading than I had before. I feel like previously I have thought that both Kate and Nicholas were both very bland, whereas I feel like on this read, I felt like Kate was a bit bland and Nicholas was very bland. Um, but there were some like nice moments. I feel like the one thing I find kind of fun about Nicholas, which I feel like I wish was developed more, is that he has this very like, keen sense of the ridiculous. There's lots of times where he's in a really ridiculous situation where he could be stressed or embarrassed by it and he actually just finds it quite funny and I do like that but I feel like I needed more stuff like that to make me feel that Nicholas is a person rather than just generic hero type and I think there is a certain extent to which he's meant to be generic hero type because he is there to be this everyman surrounded by these really eccentric characters who he interacts with but I just I just find it really hard to be interested in his life. I think that's the thing, is that Nicholas Nickleby and Kate Nickleby and their mother, Mrs Nickleby, to a certain extent, take up a lot of space on the page, but they just don't take up a lot of space in my head. Like, I just don't think they're as interesting as the rest of the cast. And obviously you can't have every single main character necessarily as eccentric as um, the minor characters, but 
I do feel that um, the balance is not quite there in Nicholas Nickleby in a way that Dickens gets it better in his later books. I feel like I just spend my life comparing other Dickens books to Our Mutual Friend, where, you know, the main characters and the minor characters are all fascinating. But anyway, I do love the minor characters in Nicholas Nickleby a lot. Luma Noggs is my absolute favourite character in Nicholas Nickleby, and he really, like, he really makes the book and he is fantastic. He's a really, really well-drawn character. He is eccentric, but he's also very human. And I think Newman Noggs is one of those characters that Dickens does fantastically where he is in some ways a caricature. He is an extreme, but he feels so real and he feels so human that even though he's kind of part of caricature, he's also really not. Um, and that's why I kind of love Dickens' characterization because of people like Newman Noggs. I think he's fantastic. And there are so many other great minor characters in Nicholas Nickleby too. I really like the Charitable Brothers. Um, I love Tim Lincoln Water. I love Miss McCreevy. Um, I love the Kenwigs. I like Smike a lot as well. And I do think Ralph Nickleby is really fantastically done. Which I think leads me on to spoilery territory. I have some more stuff I want to say about characterization, but I am getting into spoilers, I think. So if you haven't read Nicholas Nickleby, do head away now. But if you have, then please stick around I do have more to say. So I wanted to talk a bit more about Ralph Nickleby because I feel like he is a really, really interesting character and I feel like he's really well drawn. And I feel like he's an interesting character to think about in comparison to Scrooge from A Christmas Carol because in a way he is Scrooge without any possibility of redemption. Um, Nicholas Nickleby came out two years before Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol and I wonder if I wonder if when he wrote A Christmas Carol, he did have Ralph Nickleby in mind. They're both moneylenders by profession, um, Scrooge and Ralph Nickleby. And Ralph Nickleby, you could just imagine him saying bar humbug. His attitude to life is just bar humbug. It's just, I want money and nothing else matters. Scrooge in A Christmas Carol is allowed to be redeemed, right? The ghosts come and visit him and he learns to be a better person. And Ralph kind of, he can't do that. Well, he kind of almost could, because he does care about Kate Nickleby, who does care about his niece, but not enough. Not enough. And he does, there are moments later on in the book where he kind of thinks about his marriage and, and what went wrong and how there was a time when maybe he could have been a better person, but he wasn't, and now he's on this path and it's too late. I feel like in a later Dickens novel, more would have been made of that, and the characterization and the psychology would have been deeper. But I feel like at this stage, he is still kind of interested in what makes people bad, and what makes people so bad that they can't become good again? And I feel like in Ralph Nickleby, you do see that maybe there could have been something that at some point in his life could have made him a better person, but it didn't quite happen. And I feel like that is really powerful. And I feel like it's really interesting, you know, in comparison to other villains, villainous characters within Nicholas Nickleby, like Mr. Squeers, there's nothing. There's nothing there that ever could have been good, basically, in the world of the book, um, as far as Nicholas Nickleby as a novel is concerned. Whereas I feel like in Ralph Nickleby, he is a human in a way that Mr. Squeers kind of isn't. Um, I feel like Ralph Nickleby is a human, but he just blocks off his humanity um, and that destroys him and his family. And he ends up, you know, chasing his own son to death, basically, without realizing, um, because he is, unable to have any compassion for anyone and I feel like that is a really really powerful story and a really like well done element of the book like I feel like Ralph Nickleby is really really well drawn. By contrast to that one of the other spoilery things I wanted to talk about was the character of Madeleine Bray. I find Madeleine Bray one of the most disappointing elements of Nicholas Nickleby because I just feel like she's just so nothingy um and she's very much a kind of typical early Dickensian heroine or maybe love interest more than heroine she doesn't even she's not even really a heroine is she um an early Dickensian love interest where she is beautiful and good and that's all there's nothing else to Madeline Bray as a person that's all and I just I do find that very frustrating I think you get that quite a lot in early Dickens um you know it is what it is by the end of his career he wrote a lot of much better female characters than Madeline Bray but I feel like I find Madeline Bray as a character quite frustrating and I feel like I find the love story plot quite frustrating where Nicholas just sees her twice and then is just desperately in love with her and in fact it's weird in the book as well because Nicholas Nickleby sees Madeline basically falls in love with her and Dickens acknowledges that this is ridiculous like Dickens is kind of invites you to laugh at Nicholas for this passion, for this person he doesn't know at all. Um, you know, like he ends up going to the wrong house and stuff and um, Dickens makes it clear that this is all a bit silly, but then he does get to marry Madeline. So 
Dickens kind of just like says, oh, it's fine. They will be happy. It was love at first sight. I find Madeline Bray and that's the plot quite frustrating. The other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of spoilery character stuff before I talk about a few themes was the character of Smike. I find Smike really, really interesting. I feel like I'm very, very fond of Smike as a character, but I feel like the last time I read Nicholas Nickleby, it was Smike and Newman Noggs who made the book for me. And I feel like this time it was Newman Noggs. Um, and I did still think that Smike was really interesting, but I feel like I didn't think his characterization was quite as good as I had thought it was last time. I feel like Smike's presentation is complicated because he's a character with um, both kind of physical and learning disabilities, I suppose. Um, and I feel like sometimes the way Dickens characterizes him and writes about him is really sympathetic and human. And then sometimes it's just not. Like, I think there's a bit later on in the book where one of the other characters just says, oh, maybe it's for the best that he'll die. And that feels very uncomfortable to read. But then at other times I do think the presentation of Smike is really good. And I do feel like he feels like a real person. Um, one thing that I find quite interesting, having just said that all the love stories in Nicholas Nickleby are very disappointing, you know, Kate and Frank is very nothingy, um, and Madeline and Nicholas is very nothingy. But I feel like the true love story of Nicholas Nickleby is that Smike is passionately in love with Nicholas Nickleby. That's my opinion. Many years ago, when I was doing my dissertation at university on gender in Charles Dickens, I read a fantastic work of literary criticism called Queer Dickens by Holly Fernie. Um, and she talks a lot about um, queerness in Dickens. There are two kind of main things which she talks about. Um, one is kind of the presentation of non-nuclear families um, throughout Charles Dickens' works as, you know, the best kind of family in many ways, um, and how Dickens kind of like challenges ideas about nuclear families being the only kind of families, um, and how found family is like hugely important in Dickens. Um, so that's one thing which Holly Fernie talks about, which is very true and I love. And the other thing she talks about is how there are lots of characters in Dickens that you can view as um, being attracted to people of the same gender as them. And also that um, you find in lots of Dickens books, as indeed you find in a lot of Victorian literature, um, characters who have a very, very strong, almost romantic friendship with someone of the same gender, and then they conveniently fall in love with that person's sibling. That's very, very common in a lot of Victorian literature. I think there's two reasons for this. Um, I think one is because in the 19th century, it was quite hard to get to know people of the other gender because of various social rules, and therefore, um, someone of the opposite gender who you might be likely to know would be either your sibling's friend or your friend's sibling, I suppose. However, I do feel like there are lots of times in Victorian novels where it feels like a character is really in love with someone of the same gender as themselves, but they kind of like manage to transfer their affection to that person's sibling who is of the opposite gender to themselves, um, so that it's kind of like more acceptable for society. And this is certainly not just in Dickens, um, I will point you in the direction of Lady Audley's Secret if you haven't read that. To return to Nicholas Nickleby after my big tangent, I really feel like in the novel it feels like Smike is more in love with Nicholas than he is with Kate, and, and I feel like the way I have kind of viewed it in Nicholas Nickleby for a long time is that Smike is in love with Nicholas, um, but it is easier socially um, within the world he lives in to say that he is and to make himself feel that he is in love with Kate. And I feel like the love that Smike has for Nicholas, whether you want to view it as romantic or platonic or brotherly or whatever, um, I feel like the love that Smike has for Nicholas is like the truest emotion in the book. You know, having said that the love story between kind of Nicholas and Madeline and Kate and Frank, they don't feel true, but I feel like Smike's affection for Nicholas and Nicholas's affection for Smike, which I don't think is romantic, um, but like I do feel like the affection they have for each other is really true and feels really real and is kind of at the heart of the novel and I do kind of really like that. While I'm on a queer Dickens tangent, I did also notice this time that um, there's a long passage where Madeline is kind of recovering from her illness and she's talking a lot to Kate and where Dickens basically says that Madeline fell in love with Nicholas through Kate, like by talking to Kate about Nicholas and also by like regularly seeing Kate's face and how similar her face was to Nicholas, that that like made Madeline fall in love with Nicholas, which I just feel is like really interesting. Anyway, there were other things I wanted to say about Smike. It's been a very long Smike tangent. I feel like it's obviously very interesting um, that Smike turns out to be Ralph Nickleby's son. And obviously I've just spent a long time arguing that um, the great love story of Nicholas Nickleby is Smike being in love with his cousin, but you know, it was the Victorian period. But I do feel like it's interesting that Charles Dickens gives Smike this par parentage, basically. Um, both because we get Ralph Nickleby thinking, 
oh, I could have had a relationship with my son and that might have made me a different person, which I think is sort of really tragic um, in many ways. But also because it gives Mike this connection to Nicholas and Kate. Um, you know, he is their cousin and he is their cousin legally as well as biologically, which I feel like because it was important for the Victorians, it kind of is important for Smike. Um, there's some stuff I want to say which is going to contain some spoilers for Oliver Twist. So if you haven't read Oliver Twist, maybe just like mute me for a minute and I'll put a note on the screen and I'll tell you when the Oliver Twist spoilers are gone. I'll take the note down. I think it's really interesting that in Oliver Twist, because Oliver has been brought up in a workhouse, there is the kind of assumption for people around him that he's probably illegitimate. But Dickens hints that Oliver is actually legitimate. There's a mention of a wedding ring. But then it turns out at the end of the book that Oliver Twist is actually illegitimate. His parents were not married. And this is kind of a comment on um, judgment of illegitimate people, which went on a lot in Victorian society because Dickens is saying, look, you've come to care about this child. You've seen that he's really innocent. Also, his parents weren't married. Does it matter? You shouldn't care. That is kind of the point there. And I feel like it's interesting that in Nicholas Nickleby, Dickens does the opposite, where throughout the book, we have been taught to assume that Smike is illegitimate. There's a lot of talk at Squeeze's boarding school. Um, he talks a lot about the children, the boys there being natural children um, or natural sons, which means means illegitimate children. So a lot of the kids who were sent to Squeers' boarding school are there because um, their parents aren't married and they're not really wanted and that's why they're there. So the assumption all the way through the book is that Smike's parents were not married. And also, crucially, Smike is not respectable in any way throughout the book. You know, Nicholas can make himself be respectable, but Smike has trouble with that, partly because of his disabilities, partly because of the trauma he received, like he struggles to fit into a kind of respectable role in society. And therefore, I think Dickens does the opposite in Oliver Twist, where Dickens has presented this character who isn't respectable, and then he says, look, but they're legitimate. They are respectable. I feel like that's the point of Smike being legitimate. It's to kind of like give Smike the respectability in that the society won't give him, and also to give him that like legal link to Kate and Nicholas, um, as well as that biological link. Like, Smike's name is actually legally Nickleby, and I feel like that would matter to him. Um, so I feel like that's kind of interesting too. This is sparked by some discussions we were having on the Discord server, but I thought that was kind of interesting to talk about. Anyway, moving on, Oliver Twist spoilers gone. Let's talk about some themes in Nicholas Nickleby before I get cross about the ending. So, um, there are lots of interesting themes in Nicholas Nickleby. One of them I definitely think is like growing up and kind of taking charge of your life. Like in many ways, it's a coming of age story. In many ways, it's a bit of a rags to riches story. You know, it's a kind of like hero quest story in many ways, like Nicholas Nickleby be wants to save his family and get some money and be able to support his mother and sister and by the end of the book he can and that is kind of the theme of Nicholas Nickleby in some ways is that kind of like growing up hero journey I suppose for Nicholas which I find kind of interesting. Another thing that I think is a really big theme in Nicholas Nickleby is kind of like justice and injustice and kind of like people who have power taking advantage of people who don't have power. I feel like that's a really important theme in Nicholas Nickleby. Um, and I feel like the book kind of sets Nicholas up as a champion of the oppressed, which is something I find really interesting. You know, the way he tries to protect the boys at school, the way he fights Squeeze and to stick up for Smike and to stick up for the other boys at the school. Throughout the book, he sticks up for Smike. He also kind of sticks up for himself and for his family against um, Ralph Nickleby. He sticks up to Mulberry Hawk um, in order to defend his sister and sticks up to Ralph Nickleby in order to defend his sister. He sticks up to Ralph Nickleby and Arthur Gride to defend Madeline. Like, there's just, there's just a lot of Nicholas sticking up for other people um, and defending other people kind of on their behalf because they are not able to within the society or within the book. And obviously like there are moments where these characters also stick up for themselves and um, Kate Nickleby I do think does stick up for herself um, to Sir Margaret Hawk and to Ralph Nickleby um, but also the implication is that Nicholas will do it better. Um, oh Dickens. I promise I do really love Dickens but I feel like it's because I love Dickens so much that I get so angry with him especially in his early books because I just I know he can do better later. Anyway I feel like Nicholas being the kind of champion of the oppressed is a really interesting element in Nicholas. Nicholas Nickleby. Another thing that kind of ties into that I think is that I feel like a lot of Nicholas Nickleby is about kind of like the polluting power of money 
And in fact, maybe the polluting power of power. Like Ralph Nickleby has kind of been destroyed by his quest for money. And characters like Squeers and Arthur Grimes, like these are people who are greedy for money, who just want money and they don't really care about anything else except having money and maybe also having power. And I feel like the corrupting influence of money um, is a theme that you see throughout Dickens' books and which I love in his books. Um, and I feel like it's more interesting in Little Dora to Not Meet Your Friend, but it is quite interesting in Nicholas Nickleby be here. And similarly, I do think that like that drive for power um, and the danger of power and also the danger of having your power taken away. I do feel like those are all present in Nicholas Nickleby too. Like a lot of the times when the characters struggle, it's because they have their power taken away from them. Um, and I feel like Nicholas Nickleby as, you know, this champion of the oppressed is trying to like fight back against the people who have power, um, taking advantage of the people who don't have power. And that's really interesting. Which is one of the reasons why I find the ending frustrating because I feel like the book is like about how money is polluting. But of course, like at the end, Nicholas has enough money and he's now gonna be important in the firm and it'll be fine. Money is still the reward. And also like a lot of the book is about why it's not great to have your power taken away from you. And then just like at the end of the novel, Nicholas and Kate have like zero agency and the Cherubble brothers just like fix everything for them, which I just find really weird. The very ending of the book, I find really strange and kind of really frustrating because the Cherubble brothers just like arrange everything for the young people without asking them. Like they just are like, oh, it's okay, we've sorted it. Kate, you're gonna marry Frank. Nicholas, you're gonna marry Madeline. Um, you don't really have much to say in the matter. We know it's what you want, but also, you don't have any role in it. We've just sorted everything out and we've sorted out your jobs and you're fine now. And I just like, I don't know, it feels very neat, but also it feels like they have no choice. Kate and Nicholas are just kind of told that, oh, the Cheryl brothers have sorted out their lives now. You made decisions that you thought were right, but we're a bit self-sacrificial. So we've just, we've undone your decisions. And I kind of get that like, they get their happy endings for the people they want to marry, but also, we kind of don't get a choice in it. And I just find that quite weird. And actually, I feel like this is a really Dickensian, or maybe even a really Victorian thing. I can think of a few other Dickens books where an older character, usually a male older character, like arranges things for a younger character to make their life better. The younger characters are sometimes female, but not always. Um, in Nicholas Nickleby, you know, male and female characters get their lives sorted out for them. I can think of quite a few Dickens books where this happens, where an older character just like neatly, tidily arranges the life of a younger person without asking them. And then it's like, well, I fixed your life now, aren't you happy? Um, and I just, I just find that really frustrating, this thing about it that really bothers me. I wonder if it is the kind of thing that just wouldn't have really bothered the Victorians, because I feel like they lived in a much more like paternalistic society, where the idea that like an older person might just sort out your life for you wouldn't have bothered a younger person. Or indeed, you know, a society where it was more normal for a man to like order and organize and rejig the life of a woman. I don't know, but like, I just, it just really bothers me. And so I find the ending of Nicholas think be really weird because I feel like the whole point in the book has been like Nicholas getting his agency back. You know, his uncle didn't respect him, but he is like fought for people who were not, who were oppressed and like tried to get his agency back. And then at the end of the book, the Cherubble brothers are just like, well, we've fixed your life now. And I just find that very disappointing. Anyway, I feel like this has been a real, rant about Nicholas Nickleby. <laughs> I do actually really like some things about it, mostly Demon Dogs and Spike. I feel like this has been a big ramble as well. I feel like my previous reflections videos on Oliver Twist and the Pick of Papers were relatively restrained and I feel like this one has not been, but it has been fun. It has been fun to chat about Dickens. I love Dickens so much. This is one of the reasons why I love Dickens because even when I get cross with Dickens, even when there are things in his books that I don't like, they're always fascinating. Like, even when I don't like Dickens, I don't like him in an interesting way. And most of the time I do really love him. And I do think his books are great. And I just find his books fascinating and really interesting and enjoyable, even when they bother me. And that's just kind of a different joy in itself. Like, I feel like Dickens is one of those authors who I love as a reader and like as a critic and like as a historian or like a, someone interested in history, you know? Um, and I just kind of love that about his books. Anyway, this video has been quite long enough, so let's stop here. Thank you very much for watching and sticking with me through my big ramble about Nicholas Nickleby. Do let me know if you read Nicholas Nickleby lately, what did you think of it? What did you think of all the random stuff I've had to say today? And that's all for now. Thanks so much for watching and I'll be back very soon with another bookish video.